Hi, everybody. I wanted to introduce what this uh, program and project is about. Um, the name of the program is Bangla Folk, um, Bangla Folk Program. We are looking to explore the heritage of Bangladeshi arts and the, and the connection to communities in the UK and in Bangladesh. Um, we have a wonderful group of people. We're all working as a collective, we, each with our own perspective and relationship in what it means to be defining Bangladeshi art, the folk and the how it affects all the diverse communities. Um, we are working with Lancashire Encounter and um, different artists and people from different backgrounds. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Esther. Hi. I'm Esther Ferry Kennington and I am executive producer for Lancashire Encounter and I'm also executive director of Horse and Bamboo Theatre, both arts organisations that are interested in folk art, but also in diverse folk art, global folk art and how we as humans want to um, define creativity. Uh, Rahima? Hi everyone, so I'm Rahima, um, I'm an artist and activist, I'm the co-founder of an international human rights organisation called Restless Beings, um, I'm, all, I'm also an artist with um, a huge interest and passion in folk art from across the world, specifically in Asia, and so this is quite quite an uh, exciting personal journey for me. And um, I myself, I'm Ari, um, I've run a women's group based uh, mainly around South Asian women in Bostonville, it's an art and community hub um, but during the course of that I've changed the trajectory a little bit of my focus I want to look at more at my Bangladeshi heritage the connection to my family the community of Bangladeshi women in the UK and how it's impacted by folk art from Bangladesh um, from my parents generation and before and how it impacts the future of the next generations in the UK. Shall I just say about the series? Yeah. So in this podcast series, um, we'll discuss folk art as something separate from folk as a musical genre, as an academic study or the performance of tradition. We're defining folk art as the human need for creativity and expression. So I'm going to start with a question for both of you. What is Bangladeshi folk art? In the traditional sense, folk art um, is a series of motifs. So it could be, you know, motifs that are um, fish or flowers or just the lotus, the lily. Lily pads are quite common. Um, two fish together um, are quite common. Um, boats, the land, the, the nature that surrounds uh, the Bangladeshi rural landscape and the people. Those are the kind of things that you would often see as the, the symbols of folk art. Um, I mean, if you look at the history, uh, as much as as far as it's been recorded, folk art is about 2000 years old in Bangladesh. And of course, it's evolved. But one of the things that you will see over those 2000 years, as far as you can trace back, is that the same kind of symbols have evolved separately, but they still exist even now. So the two fish together swimming in the river, um, the lotus lilies, you know, um, I guess for for Bangladeshi people, folk art became um, a way to express everything that was around them, their lived experience, their daily lived experience. And um, that that is the essence of folk art. Uh, for myself, I, it's learning curve in terms of what I, what I personally feel folk art is. Obviously there's the version of what is projected, how the country has grown, how the communities have changed and how that's passed on through families. But for me, it's actually looking at the skill set because that is now deemed as a, 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 an art, a folk art. So what may have been normal from in my parents' generation or my grandparents' generation of how they used to weave um, hand fans, um, hatpakas, and for them, that was just a normal way of life. Whereas now for me to look back on how they live their lifestyle, that is an art form, that is a skill set, and that is part of the folk movement that is now going to be passed uh, across to the next generation. So in terms of what folk art is for me, it's those little things that are now going to be lost if there's no skilled people making them on a regular basis. And now it, it could have been impacted by general uh, commercial uh, import or factories but my my true 
uh, vision for bringing out folk art is being able to transfer those skill skills and that knowledge to the next generation and learning along the way because obviously me being in the British community here I was impacted as much as I would have been if I lived there and so my version and my vision is different from somebody who would have lived in Bangladesh and grown up with all these materials and uh, images around them so I think for me it's going to be more of a journey and a story. I'm so glad you mentioned um, people and the importance of people and and this kind of you know takes me to the whole idea of like folk art as um, a, a, a communal thing like a, a community coming together there is no art without the people and there's no people without the art almost that marriage of um, coming together so for example um, Alpona which is a folk art that you would see across South Asia um, in Bangladesh specifically um, it's you know uh, putting color on the floor um, in, in like a circular mandala and at the entrance of weddings or at the entrance of you know, the home, um, you would have these kind of mandalas and they're called alpana and, you know, just colored, you know, ground powder. Or for example, um, nokshikata, which is the embroidery um, for making blankets, you know, in, in intricate detailed um, embroidery. And again, all of those are about community spirits. Alpana, I mean, very rarely will you see just one person doing it, especially if it's a large one, the family will come together to do it, including children. With Nokshi, you might have a group of women sitting down talking and discussing what happened during the, the week or the, the, the season or the harvest for the month, um, and then also working on, on this blanket, which can take several months, even years at times to do. So I really, I love the spirit of people coming together that you mentioned, Ari. And I think when we come to think about people and folk art, that's where it becomes global. That that, that ceremonial manner of, of a shared piece of artwork, a shared collective creativity is how communities are brought together. It's how they become shared experiences. And that is really a very global experience, human experience. So how did this art, this folk art change through history and how does it relate to your work as an activist, Rahima? Um, so folk art, in essence, and I think this is probably why I'm so interested in our collective and, and then this project and this journey that we're about to embark on through this is that as an activist, as an artist, you know, I've always been curious to see how they work together separately and but most of all together and how art in essence becomes the activism and activism relies on art to be able to say what it needs to say just that much more powerfully. And what I found really interesting from my research, looking into folk art in Bangladesh, just my initial research, um, is how folk art ended up becoming the overall symbol of Bangladesh's determination, like visual determination. Um, so kind of to put that into context, for example, you know, it, it first it was the departure from the British colony and, and you know, the, the greater British Raj. And then, you know, Bangladesh at the time, you know, part of this greater Raj, um, you know, was was a small area, so to speak, without without a name, but it was just part of the wider. And then you had the division between East and West Pakistan, and then what we know as Bangladesh. And so through all these departures and uh, like or breaking moments, what you, what why what I found in my research is that folk art became the the visual expression to say we've we've broken again, but we're still here. We've broken again, but we're still here. And so. When you see those repetitive motifs of the lilies, the fish, the rural landscape, it's to say, look, as, as, as people, we still continue. Despite all the currents of change, we still continue. And for me, that's really exciting. Like for me to look at that and to see that as people's greatest strength is to be able to still be resilient and to still continue um, and hold their dignity and hold their peace. And then to also be able to celebrate that through art. That essentially is what Bangladesh folk art and activism together means. Um, in terms of obviously like, you know, facts and figures, I mean, you know, folk art, for example, the influential movement um, was during the period of um, when it was separating from Pakistan. And so when it became what we know as Bangladesh. And so there were influential artists um, such as Zainal Abedin, Saifuddin, Kamal Hassan. These were the three main influential artists. And one of the things that they did is they started to stylistically create a shift in folk art. So they had lots of different styles of folk art coming out. And that was to say, hey, look, we're a bunch of artists, a collective very much like ourselves. And we're here and yes, we've departed from Pakistan. We are now Bangladesh, 
but we have this art which defines us as Bangladeshis and this is our work this is our landscape this is the struggle of our people and our art symbolizes that and that's what they did and I think that shift is quite exciting and and they then became really influential figures and you know um, Zia Dean was one of the ones who founded two of the major museums the Fine Art Museum and the Folk Art Museum in Bangladesh so and that all of that for me is the journey of how activism you know shifted and evolved through the years and I guess how activism and art works together. I think the connection between folk art and nationalism is fascinating and I think for a new country which obviously is not you know the, those boundaries are arbitrary in many ways like the agriculture of the land the people who live there and actually the art that continues from Bengal uh, through into Bangladesh through the partition so on uh, the that journey is just fascinating and I think uh, you know England has its own issues with folk art being um, appropriated by nationalists far-right nationalists and and that's happened quite recently within Morris dancing that that started to be used as a tool the folk against fascism movement uh, happens because repeatedly another set of people say oh this represents a far-right point of view and certainly most of the folk uh, people that I know don't subscribe to that, not to say all of them. Um, lovely to touch on the folk art museums. And Ari, maybe you could tell us a bit more about your research into folk art museums in Dhaka and Select. I'm just going to give a little bit of background here. Um, I, I tend to um, say my, my approach to the work is more less academic. Um, it's more from a root community value. So my initial encounters with uh, museums and art was through Manchester Museum, through Horse and Bamboo, and a few of the local uh, community groups. So I was, I was keen to expose women from my community, families from my community, not only about our own heritage, but what was already on display because we didn't utilize that. So when, as a community, when you're surrounded by a big institution, which is there um, and you haven't visited that institution to learn from, that's one big step. So now apply that same theory back to uh, Bangladesh, to Dhaka, major city, um, and to a local community museum in Silid. So my um, interest was to see how people who have been surrounded by, uh, you know, an institution in uh, Dhaka city, how they've evolved versus how people who haven't been encountered with that and also people who have had a, a museum. So when we look at the institutions in Dhaka, you have the um, uh, international museums, you have the colleges and you have the universities, which I'm not going to go too much into because everybody knows what they are. And I also feel there is a narrative there where it is mostly for visitors to come and see what the country wants to showcase. This is what we are, this is, what, this is who we can, everybody come and see. And it's more for um, other uh, bodies, other universities and other museums to come and say, right, let's, you know, let's learn from you. But again, when we draw that back to root value, I want to not only go to uh, learn about the institutions. I wanted to learn about the little village institution which represent the villages and the communities and their lifestyle. So one of the uh, museums that I looked quite closely into and I've spoken to a few people there and the intention is when and when we do visit them is to learn a lot more hands-on from them and hopefully take a lot of questions and you know eagerness from our communities to uh, I'm going to pronounce it Shunagram Museum in Silet and what they've done is something really fascinating they've tried as a community so it's not a government funded they've tried as a community to preserve the skill sets of traditional making of pottery making of hatpakas making of anything that they had done within their community so it is a, a life museum representing the local area and not only that they have still stayed in contact with the families who were made let's say for example the potters or the the main families that stayed in ceramics they've stayed in contact with them so when somebody like me who wants to come and learn can go into that museum and visit the families and the communities and they can then bring up out the retired artisans, which we, for us it's artists and for them it's, you know, a, a grandfather in the village, bring them out of retirement so they can encourage that the life of that skill set is still lived. Um, so from, from an um, art point of view, 
I just think that's fascinating and how we can bring some of that into our communities so skills aren't lost and it's not just about the skills that it's the stories and it's the narrative and it's how they used to live that isn't forgotten and I think sometimes there's a big disconnect because my parents came from Bangladesh so they influenced me and I have a connection and then what I pass on to the next generation is a, is a little less because obviously I have only retained a certain amount of um, knowledge and information and as a as a as a group and as a collective I expect ourselves to create a blip in this narrative and pull back some more and give you know give nourishment to the community so this is how I see um, the the art Bangla art folk as like food for the soul food for the next generation so that's what I'm hoping to um, learn and gain from um, my main focus Shunagram Museum I just I don't think I need to go many places that that one museum will have everything as much as I I'll probably will be visit, I just think you know I you can spend years um years visiting every everywhere and you know learning everything but my first aim is just to go see how people live their life and you know for me I've not missed out on it there's so much that I don't know so I just want to start with the basics I don't want to go to the big institutions I just want to go out in the wild in the free and just learn how people have grown from living their life in the village to them what they see as normal but for us what we now see as Bangla folk history. I think also there's something about how big institutions represent something like folk art. I just I didn't want to go into that too much, but I yeah. would if you want me to. Well, because I have a book which when I started to look at what is folk art, because obviously it was brought brought up in an English folk tradition, but that meaning a tradition of Morris dance and a tradition of song. And for me, what I started to learn was that the new folk arts, like the the like the dance that I do is born of the mills but is in the main done by work by middle class people so 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 now it, it's this 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 sort of almost appropriation from class to class of a tradition which is reasonably static like i know people who write dances still but the tradition itself has remained reasonably static and so I started to think about broader, you know, we started to meet with Ari and, and Rahima yourself, and we started to talk about this programme and other conversations which will come into this podcast and how interesting that makes folk. And let's be honest, I sang in a pub the first time when I was about eight years old. So I, I'm a, a little bit bored of the English folk canon, basically. And so I started to look outside and started to look at other musical genres that might be considered a folk art, but wouldn't sit within folk as a genre in a record shop where you actually go and you look for folk music so I found out that Tate Britain had done a, a British folk art um, uh, exhibition and it talked very much about weather vanes and pub signs and these again really quite you know they're quite they're working class or they're, they're, they're um, utilitarian art art that's just there on every street corner and I just became absolutely fascinated by by the whole by the whole the whole term folk art and what it would mean. And through this podcast series, we'll look at um, for football uh, chants on the terraces. We'll look at um, drag as a folk art. You know, various different perspectives on that. But I think conversations with you, Ari, the ones about about how those artisans are brought into that that museum being a smaller institution being able to focus on that art itself I find really exciting because it's not being co-opted into this bigger institution of visual art or this process of curation or all, all those kinds of aspects um it's it's not the normal packaging so I think that's one of the um versions I'm trying to avoid which is you know you go to a museum it's very well packaged and it's kind of not watered down it's facts black and white here we go exposure um there's so much in between the words that we miss so I that's that's why going to a lived museum or a lived area where it's still prominent um you get so much more than what the little, mm. little black says mm. and the dates and the duration you'll get to know the families you'll get to experience it so that's that's what i'm really really excited about uh like literally just to echo on from what you esther said and ari what you've said as well about just again the the, the harmony like the marriage between people and and folk art but actually people actually people who are 
the symbols of the folk art themselves. Um, I, I've, I'm really fascinated by that. I mean, in, in terms of like um, people in Bangladesh, you know, folk art can, it's not just always visual, although that's one of the areas that I'm really interested in. Um, you know, we, when we go on protest as an activist, you know, I, I will come together with my team and we'll be painting, you know, protest banners. And for me, I see folk art in the same spirit almost in Bangladesh. Um, and again, you know, when um, women come together to make these blankets, or women come together to make, you know, a, a hand fan made from bamboo woven together, or when they come together to talk about the harvest of the month, um, for me, that is the lived experience. That is, you know, when they talk about this year, you know, we had too much rainfall and so we didn't get this X amount of harvest. You know, that is the, the struggle of that time. That is the, the, the things that make these people, you know, in that moment feel like I need to speak about this. I need to champion this or I need to resist to this. And to be able to capture that through folk art is, is exciting. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that's been captured. And one of the things that I found just, you know, just generally reading about folk art um, is how it took so many different forms, you know, again, as I mentioned, the visual, but then through Jatra in terms of theatre um, and in terms of drag and, as you said, you know, the costumes, the, the backdrops, all of those, again, were bringing in those symbols of the flowers, the lilies, the fish, but also what happened today, what am I angry about today? You know, we had a thief in our village today. You know, what should we do to oust him out? You know, and things like that. So all of those animated, you know, quite exciting, quite dramatic storytelling processes, visually and on stage, um, is activism today almost as well. We, we do this in our own theatrical way. So um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how, you know, we can keep digging and, and seeing what surfaces through our own journeys through this. Esther, do you want to add anything? I was just going to say how much that, what you've said there about Jatra, which we haven't really mentioned, but is one of the key things that we started talking about as in the Bangla Folk Programme, um, really resonates with what's called a broadside ballad, which was a, a, a sort of penny ballad written on a street corner um, that you could literally commission somebody to say, can you write a song for my Uncle John's 60th birthday? He does this and this and this. This is what he thinks is funny. Um, and that now we've talked, one of the conversations I've been having is how kind of TikTok, YouTube content is that is that kind of responsive broadside ballad, um, you know, exactly as you're saying, you know, today, we're still doing those processes as humans. They just come through in different ways. People need to talk through the things that impact them and the, those, you know, if it, if it be a song or a piece of writing or a, they're all art, aren't they? When they when they come out the other side of what, of the thought process and the the energy that's behind it, be that positive or negative. Um, I, one of the interesting things that I want to compare as a side note, um, and Bangla folk will give us the tools to do this, but it's definitely a side note is other cultures, um, and Western cultures and, and Bangla culture. So one of the key things and one of the reasons I'll go back to village is uh, when a child is born the village raises the child so you know mother is working fathers or father's working grandparents are raising them so you know the uh, the hand down of knowledge is done a certain way now because of the way the western society has evolved this includes us how we live you know large families have gone down to small families and it's, you know who would have thought that my um family of seven brothers and sisters now suddenly you know um in the next generation i have one so it's just gone from yay to yay but the culture that's pass through which I call the thread of society is completely changed so maybe we have a lot to learn from those communities or bring back because we don't see it on a day-to-day -day and you know re-implement that you know consciously or unconsciously because now when we look yes we are forgetting things and yes things are being forgotten but if we do a little bit more digging there is so much knowledge out there just you know like herbal natural you know family raising that has been lost because we were told that uh, technology makes things more convenient you know stick an ipad in front of a child um, yes you have a free babysitter but we all know there's there's an impact to it um so i'm interested to see how 
what we gain from that, what we can pull back. And it'd be interesting to have, you know, there is a varied range of people in our collective, you know, parents, non-parents, um, uncles, aunties, how that Im impacts how we narrate the story. I, I just wanted to make that connection. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.